questions and contributions afterwards. So, go ahead. Yeah, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'd like to start by saying that there are comrades in the room from different uh, countries. Uh, there's comrades from Sweden, comrades from France, from uh, Britain, there's uh, comrades from Spain and other countries. But uh, the difference is that in the countries where we conduct our political work, where we conduct political agitation, trade union uh, struggle and so on, we can do so more or less within the limits of bourgeois democracy. We are allowed to demonstrate, to picket, to uh, conduct propaganda, to sell papers, to produce papers, more or less, I say, within the limits of bourgeois democracy, which is uh, limited. But in Ukraine, as we speak, most of these democra basic democratic rights have been completely uh, smashed. The offices of the Communist Party, including the central headquarters of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Ukraine in Kiev, have been ransacked, attacked by fascist uh, gangs, occupied, uh, burned down, and not only in uh, Kiev, but in other parts of the country. An organization which is called uh, Borodba, the struggle, uh, which is a socialist, a communist uh, organization that was set up a few years back, has had to go underground because they've had their offices uh, attacked by fascist gangs, by the National Guard. And uh, these days there is, no more, there is no real difference between the two things because the fascists have been incorporated into the National uh, Guard. Sometimes you don't know whether you're dealing with, uh, with a paramilitary fascist organization which is uh, not part of the state or one that is part of the state uh, apparatus. Many of the members of Borodba have had to go uh, into exile in different uh, places. Uh, the president of the Rada, the president of the parliament, Turchinov, has uh, written a letter to the state uh, prosecutor demanding the beginning of uh, proceedings towards the ban, the banning of the Communist uh, Party, which is a party that got uh, nearly three million votes in the last uh, elections, has hundreds of thousands of members and supporters throughout the country. And this is only in that part of the country which is not being uh, bombed by the anti-terrorist uh, operation organized by the, by the government of uh, Prime Minister Yatsenyuk and uh, the, now, the now President uh, Poroshenko. So that is why we're talking here about the struggle against fascism in, uh, in the Ukraine and that, that puts the, the need for the solidarity campaign very clearly on the agenda for anyone who, ne never mind being a socialist or a communist or, uh, or a revolutionary, but any consistent Democrat should join such a campaign against the Kiev uh, government, which is incidentally fully backed by uh, NATO, by Washington, by uh, Berlin, by, uh, by, by the government in, in, uh, in London, by the conservative uh, liberal Democrat government uh, here in this, uh, in this country. So we, we should uh, start at that uh, point. So how did we get here? Uh, I think that you can go back quite a lot. And the main cause, I would, I would say the root cause for, for the conflict that is taking place in Ukraine, for the situation that Ukraine is uh, going through now, can clearly by, be identified uh, 20, 25 years ago with the collapse of uh, Stalinism and the restoration of capitalism. And the terrible social economic uh, crisis that uh, befell on, uh, on Ukraine as a result of this. Massive destruction of uh, industry, massive uh, setbacks in the fields of culture, education, and the forced uh, emigration of millions of its uh, citizens, uh, illegally in most cases, to, uh, to European uh, countries where they carry out the worst uh, jobs in illegal conditions without papers in, mo in many cases and so on. And uh, basically mass unemployment in the country, a serious economic uh, collapse at all, uh, at all uh, levels. That, I would say, is the root cause of everything that's happened in uh, Ukraine. And if we don't understand that, we will not be able to point out what is the, what is the solution. A solution that now increasingly appears more clear to a growing number of, uh, of uh, Ukrainians. Now, the, this is the, the root cause of the conflict, of the situation that uh, Ukraine is in now. But the immediate chain of events that led to this uh, extremely reactionary right-wing government with fascist or far-right elements uh, within it uh, can be traced down to the time in uh, the end of last year when the president uh, Yanukovych refused to sign 
the accession treaty or the, uh, the agreement with the European uh, Union. Now, uh, Yanukovych by no means can be described as a progressive uh, president, is a reactionary uh, oligarch representing the interests of the oligarchs, i.e. those uh, capitalist uh, thieves and plunderers who benefited from the restoration of uh, capitalism, who mostly by illegal means got their hands into what was previously state-owned uh, property, uh, sold out at, uh, for peanuts, and uh, expropriated by these uh, private uh, gangsters, really, who used uh, mafia methods to fight each other and to get their hands onto this uh, property. Uh, so he was a representative of the oligarchs, or at least of one wing of the uh, oligarchs, and uh, as soon as the movement of protest against his government started, he also used repressive uh, uh, methods. However, the, the point why uh, he was removed, the reason why he was removed, was not because he was a right-winger or he represented the interest of the oligarchs. He was removed because it, did, it, was, it was not convenient to the interests of those sections of the oligarchs that were more closely aligned with Washington, NATO, and uh, the West. Uh, the reason why it is, it is uh, almost ironic, if you look at uh, the policies of Yanukovych, he was actually following pro-IMF privatization uh, policies. Now, a few weeks ago, the current government in uh, Ukraine announced the privatization of 38 coal mines in the Donetsk uh, region. But the plans for that privatization had already been introduced or started by uh, Yanukovych. He, he was quite compliant to the interest of uh, capitalism internationally uh, and even the West, uh, uh, the Western uh, capitalism. But at the, at the last minute, he had a change of uh, mind. And, and the reason for this is very simple. For a period of time, German capitalism uh, was pushing towards the East. And as long as there was an economic uh, upswing in the West, they were prepared even to uh, use quite a lot of capital and uh, money to bring these countries into the European uh, Union, countries in the, in the East of uh, Europe. But uh, in the year 2000 and, uh, 2013, this was no longer the case. Uh, the European Union is in the middle of a serious uh, crisis and there's a lot of problems inside, and uh, they've uh, had to bail out Greece, which is not really a bailout of Greece, but a bailout of the German banks, as we know. But in any case, a lot of money is being uh, used to try to, uh, to try to contain this crisis of capitalism in Europe. And Germany, particularly, which dominates uh, Europe, is not prepared to uh, give uh, Ukraine any uh, subsidies or even any bailouts and the conditions that they were imposing on these bailouts were very uh, strong conditions. And at the same time, Russia stepped in and said, well, look, I mean, we, we prepared to give you a bailout in much better conditions, a loan that we paid over a longer period of time with lower interest rates and less conditionalities uh, attached. So uh, Yanukovych, being a crook, being a gangster, he chose the best uh, option for him, which was uh, Ukraine, he was, uh, which was uh, the agreement with Russia. And he was also trying to play one against uh, the other, try to get better conditions for his own uh, domination of, uh, of Ukraine. Um, and this, uh, the, the, the day when he announced that he was not going to sign the accession treaty with the European uh, Union, was the beginning of this uh, so-called Maidan movement. Maidan being uh, the independent square in Kiev where people started to uh, gather. Now, uh, I have no doubt that there were many uh, people who went to this square and they were honestly fighting against Yanukovych. Even some of them thought that they were fighting against the oligarchs and for democracy. But this is uh, beyond the point. The class composition, the political demands and the forces that were behind this movement were wholly reactionary and could only lead to a reactionary uh, uh, outcome. Uh, why do I say this? Because there are many people in, uh, in the Ukraine that have this illusion that the European Union somehow is uh, paradise on earth and is going to come in. And, and if Ukraine joins the European Union, the living standards in the Ukraine somehow magically are going to become the living standards of, uh, of Germany. This is obviously false from all points of view and it's a reactionary illusion. But you can understand why many people in Ukraine think uh, that because the conditions of life they've had for the last 20 years 
so unbearable that anything that uh, can look like a solution uh, is, is an attractive uh, proposition. But obviously these illusions were manipulated by the oligarchs, the oligarchs that were opposed to uh, Yanukovych, and by Washington. Washington had a big hand in this uh, movement. And as we know, Victoria Nuland herself uh, admitted that they've, they'd spent over a period of time five, five, uh, five million uh, dollars in uh, propping up the opposition uh, movement in, uh, in the Ukraine. And we know how the United States was involved in the Orange Revolution uh, uh, earlier, uh, earlier on, 10 years uh, uh, ago. The class composition of this movement was also interesting to look at. It was composed mainly of uh, middle class petty bourgeois of uh, Kiev, uh, people in, in uh, the, the places where the Maidan movement had the strongest support, were the places in the West, mainly agricultural uh, uh, regions, uh, as opposed to the industrial regions in the South and the, and the East, and obviously had the support of uh, the ruined elements of the, of the middle class, and people who uh, were looking for some sort of magical uh, solution. The demonstrations uh, went on for a number of uh, weeks and uh, months. And finally, when it seemed that uh, Yanukovych had been pushed to reach a deal in which he would uh, step down, there will be new elections and so on, then there was the killing at the Maidan uh, Square where snipers fired on the demonstrators and also uh, police were killed. And uh, I think we will never really know who was behind those uh, killings. There's many theories uh, around. But what is clear is that at that time, the official bourgeois opposition and Yanukovych had already reached the deal. And uh, the deal was one for, for some sort of uh, uh, transfer of uh, power. And uh, this deal was completely ruined and destroyed by these uh, shootings. And therefore, there was the overthrow of uh, Yanukovych. He fled the country. And immediately, the parliament voted in a new uh, acting uh, government, which is still in uh, place a few months uh, later. This was in February. So this is February, March, April, May, June. The end of June is nearly six months. The acting government is still in, uh, in place. And the conditions in which, because this is a contentious uh, issue, some people call the government in Kiev uh, junta, mainly the protesters against the, against the Kiev government, and some others say, no, no, this is a legitimate government. But, I mean, we all seen the pictures of how this vote took place. There were armed paramilitary fascists at the entrance of the Rada, uh, from the right sector, from Svoboda and other far-right organizations, the maiden self-defenses. And the members of parliament inside had very little choice over, over what to uh, vote. Otherwise, they would be beaten uh, up. Many of them didn't even turn up to the, to the meeting, were not present, and so on. A new government was voted in, presided by the reactionary uh, bourgeois parties, uh, the party of uh, Timoshenko, the party of Yatseniuk, and, uh, and a whole number of reactionary parties. But it also included elements from Svoboda, which is a far-right uh, party with uh, clear fascist elements uh, in it. This is a party that's gone from being an openly fascist party, which was called the Social Nationalist uh, Party of Ukraine uh, about 10 years ago, to being a respectable far-right uh, party. But the members of this uh, party haven't changed that uh, much. And this is the party, for instance, which organized this year in uh, Lvov the commemoration of the founding of the SS Galicia Division, which is a division of the SS uh, Nazi troops that was composed of Ukrainian uh, volunteers. It was this party, which is part of this government, that organized that uh, commemoration. That's not, uh, that's not a respectable uh, far-right bourgeois party, but a party that clearly contains fascist uh, uh, elements. Uh, and, this, and this new government, which was an acting uh, government, which had little uh, legitimacy, immediately started carrying out a whole series of measures that were seen, uh, and they were a clear provocation against the people in the east and, uh, and the south of the, of the country, which were these uh, measures. In fact, Yatsenyuk, at one point, he said, this is going to be a kamikaze government, meaning we're going to introduce all these uh, counter-reforms that are demanded by the IMF in a short space of time, it doesn't matter if after that we are burnt out of politics, then we'll have new elections and there will be a new government that will have some legitimacy and we will be responsible for these very unpopular measures 
they need to be introduced. And they started carrying out those measures. For instance, the IMF demanded uh, the lifting of subsidies on uh, fuel, fuel and uh, gas for, uh, for home consumption, for heating and so on. And they immediately introduced a 50% rise in the price of, uh, of uh, gas for, heat, for heating, household heating. Uh, they uh, started a um, program of privatizations. The IMF, which they already signed a deal with the IMF, a 19, I think it's 19 or 17 billion dollar bailout. And the strings attached to this bailout include uh, massive layoffs of public sector workers, freezing of wages, pensions, and minimum wage for public sector workers, uh, mass privatization, uh, reform of the, of the legal framework for, to make it more business friendly, and a whole number of other measures that we can, uh, we can uh, see if we just look at what's happened in Greece over the last five or six years. You can see the same measures being implemented in, uh, in the Ukraine. But no, it wasn't only this, because this government is composed by, uh, by radical Ukrainian right-wing uh, reactionary nationalists and some far-right elements. It also took some measures that were a provocation from a national uh, and democratic point of view. For instance, this new government appointed new governors to all the regions, but particularly in the regions of the south and the east, they appointed, they appointed the most hated oligarchs. So that now you have a situation where the top 10 richest uh, uh, businessmen in uh, Ukraine, they are all either in government or they are, or, or they are the president, Poroshenko, or they are all governors of this uh, region, Staruta in uh, Donetsk, Kolomoisky in Dnipetrovsk, and uh, uh, Hermes in uh, Kharkov, and a whole number of uh, very hated uh, oligarchs were appointed as governors of these regions. So the people immediately started demanding the right to appoint their own uh, governors, which is basic uh, democratic uh, demand. Uh, also, the Rada, the parliament, passed uh, a law which uh, revoked an earlier law introduced by Yanukovych, which gave uh, minority languages the possibility to have an official status at a regional level. That, that's not only Russian, but all the minority languages that exist in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and this law was passed by the Rada. It was the first, one of the first decisions of the Rada after the fall of uh, Yanukovych. This is a clear provocation against the Russian-speaking uh, minority, which in, in these regions of the south and the east is a majority of the, of the population. And it meant for them the danger of the, the linguistic rights being, uh, being uh, trampled uh, upon. Uh, this law, just for clarification, was finally never passed into, uh, into being because the president, the acting uh, president, uh, Turchinov, uh, decided not to sign it because it was such, such an uproar. But the message that was sent was already very clear to the people in the south and the east. Uh, not only this, but the people in the south and the east of the country are the most industrial areas where the coal mines are, the steel works. There's a heavily proletarian uh, composition in these regions. And they knew very clearly, they, they, they realized that uh, the signing of any deal with the European Union and the signing of any deal with the IMF meant the so-called restructuring of the industries in these regions, meaning mass layoffs, the closing down of uh, so-called uh, uh, loss-making uh, companies and, uh, and so on. I mean, we discussed uh, on Friday the miners' strike in, uh, in Britain. They, they know what this, uh, this will mean in, in the south and the east of, uh, of Ukraine. And so the combination of all these uh, measures of the new government and the, the, the fact that the government was seen, and it was, clearly representing the interests of the oligarchs, but not, all, not even of all the oligarchs, but mainly the oligarchs based in the west and the center of the, of the country, <coughs> was seen as, a, as an enemy government by the by majority of the people in these uh, regions, gave rise to a protest uh, movement. And there were demonstrations, big and small, over a long period of time, in uh, Kharkov, in Donetsk, in Luhansk, in Odessa, in Yepetrovsk, in, in, in other regions. Uh, and now uh, the, official, the official story of the Kiev government is that these demonstrations were organized and uh, were provoked by Russian uh, agents uh, or by agents of Yanukovych, the deposed uh, president. Now I have no doubt that uh, Russian agents that are in uh, Ukraine, it would be silly, silly to think uh, otherwise, 
And I have no doubt that also some people, <clears throat> and this is a fact, some people in the party of the regions, the party of Yanukovych, were present, particularly at the beginning, in some of these uh, protests. But it's very significant that they are not present uh, now. Uh, and, uh, for instance, in Kharkov, when uh, the governor Hermes tried to put himself at the head of the demonstrations, the demonstrators kicked him out because they knew he's, uh, he's a double-faced um, oligarch. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was not interested in the genuine uh, demands that this movement was putting forward. What, what, are the demands of the, what were the demands of the movement? One, some sort of regional autonomy uh, expressed in the demand for federalization of the country so that they will be able, A, to elect their own governors and B, to keep part of the revenue for the development of these uh, regions. There was a strong feeling that these regions are industrially rich they're producing uh, most of the GDP of the country, but then this is appropriated by the oligarchs based in the, in the center and the west of the country. So this is demand for some sort of uh, devolution or, or self-control of the tax raising with tax raising, tax raising powers and so on. There was also the question of language, language uh, rights. But in general, I will say that <coughs> the character of this movement in, uh, in the east and the, and the south was uh, also a socio-economic uh, movement, i.e. a movement of the working class in defense of their jobs, their livelihood, uh, and against the oligarchs. It had a strong anti-oligarchic uh, component. In fact, there was an opinion poll, even before the anti-terrorist operation started and all these things, that showed that uh, they asked the people throughout the country, uh, one, what what interest they thought the government represented. The majority of people in Donetsk and Lugansk thought that this was a government of the oligarchs, about 60-70%. They, they are right. Uh, majority, when they were asked what should happen to the property of the oligarchs, a big majority said that the property which was acquired illegally should be expropriated, should be nationalized. Now, uh, this is quite significant because all of the property of the oligarchs was acquired uh, illegally. But even in Luhansk, which is a place where the Communist Party used to get about 20% of the, of the vote, uh, when they were asked about the property of the oligarchs, they said that all the property of the oligarchs, regardless of how it was obtained, should be expropriated. 25% of the people, which if you add to 40% that said that illegal property should be expropriated, gives a big majority, two-third majority, for the expropriation of the oligarchs. And this is the character of this uh, movement, deep down, these are the roots of this uh, movement. It had very little to do with Russian uh, agents. Russian agents are not for the expropriation of the, uh, of the oligarchs, as you can uh, understand. The oligarchs are in power in, uh, in Moscow and in the, and in the Kremlin. Uh, and so this is the situation. And another added element to all of this was obviously clear provocation on the part of, Russian, uh, on the part of US uh, imperialism against Russia. Uh, over the last 20, 25 years, uh, the West and NATO has been advancing against uh, Russia, has been advancing eastwards. So that now there are countries that are directly on the border of, the, of, the, of Russia, which are members of NATO or have an associated uh, status in NATO, uh, the, in the Baltic states, uh, in Poland, uh, and even a number of countries that used to be um, Soviet republics, and that Russia considers as part of its sphere of uh, influence, uh, now members of NATO or have NATO troops uh, in it. And this is obviously a clear provocation for uh, Russia. And anyone who understands anything about international relations and, and diplomacy knew that the installation in Kiev of a government whose stated aim was that Ukraine should join NATO and the European Union was a clear provocation that Russia couldn't uh, let go, couldn't uh, allow to happen. Uh, particularly because in uh, the Ukraine there is a big, there was a big military naval base of the U.S. Uh, of sorry of the Russian uh, fleet in uh, Crimea, uh, where, where there are twenty thousand. There, there used to be twenty thousand Russian troops stationed in a, in a key naval base for the Russian uh, fleet. So obviously, what did Russia do? It was completely predictable. They went in uh, into Crimea. And they took it over without any, uh, with an, without any bloodshed, any loss of, uh, of life, basically. Uh, and then they carried out a referendum in which the majority of the population voted they wanted to be part of the Russian Federation. 
regardless of the democratic guarantees that this uh, referendum had or, or didn't have, it is clear that it expressed a majority uh, opinion of the population in, uh, in, uh, in Crimea. Uh, but it is a different thing, it is one thing for Russia to uh, carry out the annexation of uh, Crimea, it is a very different thing for Russia to carry out the annexation of Donetsk and, uh, and Luhansk. Uh, Russia does not want to take over these two uh, regions. In fact, the, the interest of the Russian uh, ruling uh, elite, uh, the capitalist in the, in the Kremlin, is, is probably, their, their interests are probably best served with the situation in Ukraine where they have a say in the country, where, where the country has a, a status that is in between the West and, uh, and Russia, and they have some, uh, some say in what happens in, uh, in the Ukraine. Because imagine this, the takeover of Donetsk and uh, Luhansk will mean uh, the annex, first of all, it will mean war. I mean, this, this wouldn't be the same thing as uh, Crimea, a war in which NATO will get uh, involved. And this is not a, not, not a very uh, uh, good prospect from the point of view of Russia, but also will be taking over these industrial uh, rich uh, areas, which, which will be and needing restructuring from a capitalist point of view. And then the problem will be for Russia to deal with these uh, problems. Not only this, but now in these regions, there is, a, there is a mobilized population. They've been threatening to nationalize the oligarchs. And they were bringing all that into Russia, which is not very uh, good. I mean, uh, Kremlin, uh, Putin benefited from this whole crisis because as soon as he annexed uh, uh, Crimea, there was an upsurge in popularity for Putin. There was uh, an upsurge in Russian uh, nationalism, our nation strong again, standing up against imperialism. But uh, the Kremlin is not really for a direct confrontation with the uh, with, uh, West. They, they, want just, they just want better, better, deals, better deals and better conditions uh, to deal with, uh, with it. Now what happened with this movement is that this movement uh, developed and, in some, uh, and, and the movement did not think that he could talk to the Kiev uh, government. The Kiev government continued with its policies unchanged, did not make any concessions. So people in the East and the South decided to do what? Well, in some places they started taking over municipal uh, buildings. Now, where did they get the idea that you can take municipal uh, buildings? Well, uh, from the Maidan movement. The Maidan movement, as we know, took over the city council in uh, Kiev and uh, adopted this, uh, this um, tactics of struggle, of taking over public uh, buildings and uh, occupying them by armed uh, force. So they thought, well, if they got what they wanted by doing this, we're also going to get what we want by, by doing uh, this, since there seems to be no other option. And so municipal buildings were occupied in a whole number of uh, towns and cities in Luhansk, in uh, Donetsk, in the two regions, in the capital of these two regions. And also in other places, there were attempts to occupy municipal buildings in, uh, in Kharkov, in Odessa, but they were less uh, successful for a variety of uh, reasons. And once they uh, did this, obviously the question became also of the state apparatus. And in the same way that during the Maidan movement, the state apparatus in some of the regions, for instance in Lvov and in other places, went over to the, to the rebel movement, to the protest movement. In, this, in the same way, in, uh, in uh, Luhansk and Donetsk, quite a lot of the state apparatus, the local police, the local security service and so on went over to the side of the of the people of the demonstrators, and this is something that happens in any in any genuine revolutionary event. I mean, these police officers are local people. They have families. They have neighbors. The neighbors are probably involved in this movement, and they were they are surrounded by a big crowd of people, some of whom are armed, but the majority are, are disarmed. They're not going to start shooting at them unless they think that the situation uh, is going to come down on the side and this was not clear to them at this uh, point. And as soon as this happened, the government decided, uh, this right-wing reactionary ultranationalist government decided to declare uh, these people as terrorists and uh, deal with them through armed uh, force. Uh, now, if you think about it, this is one step uh, beyond what Yanukovych ever did. Yanukovych used the, the police and the, and the security forces against the demonstrators, but he never thought about declaring an anti-terrorist uh, operation and using the army and the Ministry of Interior troops and creating a National Guard to fight its own, uh, its own uh, 
people did because this is what it is. This is a unilateral, almost unilateral war by Kiev against the uh, population in these uh, regions. Anti-terrorist operation started on May the 2nd and so it's now been going on for the best part of two months. Um, and the thing is that it has not really, uh, in this period of time of two months, achieved uh, any of its main uh, aims, although the situation seems to be shifting in the last uh, 48 uh, hours. But why is it? I mean, you have a government, the government has access to a military force, and if this is the case, that uh, this is a small group of Russian agents and paid mercenaries, they should be able to eliminate them very quickly. But as we know, this was not the case. In the first week, and in the second week, and in the third week of the anti-terrorist operation in May, what we saw, and it was, this was broadcasted uh, worldwide, was the civilian population in these towns and cities, in uh, Slovyansk, in Kramatorsk, and in other places, coming out, surrounding the troops that being sent by Kiev, and then the troops refusing to fire. And in one case, they even handed over six armored personnel carriers to the, to the rebels. Uh, and the reason is clear, because these troops are mainly composed of uh, conscript or reserve soldiers, uh, many of them from the same uh, region. And uh, one uh, officer, I think it was a captain or lieutenant of this, of one of this, uh, in one of these incidents, he said to the people, he said that they've been surrounded for a whole day. He said, look, I mean, I've been, uh, I am in favor of the territorial integrity of Ukraine. So you, you will be probably a Ukrainian nationalist. But he said, but I've been told that uh, we were coming here to fight the terrorists. And what I find is the people. And I'm not prepared to fight against my own uh, people. So this is, a, this is quite a, a, a bad situation from the point of view of Kiev, where there's, there's mutinies in the army, there's fraternization with the local population. And it also shows the real character of this movement as a mass popular movement. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the case. You know, I mean, uh, there are many places around the world where small groups of terrorists are, uh, are eliminated if they don't have support from the, from the, from the population, if the armed men have no support from the, from the population at large. Uh, just uh, before I go into this question, it's worth stopping at this point uh, of May the 2nd, which is the same day that the anti-terrorist operation started, was the Odessa massacre. And in the Odessa massacre, the official figures say that 42 or 48 people were killed, but many people in Odessa think that the numbers were much bigger and that these were never, never, never pro pro properly uh, counted. There's talk about 100 or 200 people being killed in that uh, building, the, the trade union building, where anti-Kiev demonstrators had uh, <coughs> barricaded themselves in order to seek refuge from this advancing crowd of uh, fascist and football hooligans that were going there. Uh, with one clear aim. They were not just demonstrating for the unity of Ukraine. I mean, if uh, you have a, a mass of people, some of them armed, some of them armed with weapons, uh, with uh, guns and so on. And uh, they are shouting, glory to Ukraine, death to the, death to the traitors. I mean, you know that they're going to come and kill you, or at least attempt to uh, kill you. And then they set the building on fire, and many people were killed. Uh, inside. Some people were killed trying to jump out of that building. Some people were killed after they jumped out of the building. They were, they were beaten up uh, on the floor. There were people who are known figures in the maiden self-defense who were shooting at the windows as people were trying to escape from the building. And there, there's also footage, which has not been widely uh, uh, broadcasted, of, of uh, these fascist thugs coming into the building as the building was already in uh, fire and beating up people inside and killing people inside uh, which couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, come out of the building. So this was really a, a, a massacre. And, and this was the culmination of a series of events that had, had taken place in other places, in Donetsk, in Kharkov. Uh, in the weeks leading up to May the 2nd, there were football matches which were used as an excuse for football hooligans, mostly right-wing uh, fascist uh, elements, and fascist paramilitaries to demonstrate in these cities where there had been big anti-Kiev demonstrations in order to uh, terrorize the anti-Kiev demonstrators and show who was uh, boss. It was a deliberate campaign of armed uh, fascist provocations in all these uh, places that led to this uh, event. 
It is interesting to note that the UN, the UN High Commission for Human Rights issued a statement last uh, week and they said that uh, the government's so-called investigation on the Odessa events is a farce, that the governments refuse to collaborate with the UN High Commission. And I mean, the UN High Commission is not exactly a revolutionary uh, body. It is supposed to be impartial, uh, supposed to be impartial, you know. Uh, so if, if the UN, United Nations High Commission for, for Human Rights says that, this, the, the truth is much uh, worse, clear. And that was also a crucial turning point for many people in the East and in the South saying, look, uh, some people said, look, after these events, I do not no longer feel uh, Ukrainian anymore. If Ukraine is this, the, the massacre of, uh, civi of uh, unarmed civilians in that uh, building, in the, in the way it happened, they don't feel part of this country anymore. And any ideas that uh, this uh, region should be independent were obviously much strengthened out of uh, this uh, situation and obviously after, uh, out of the anti-terrorist uh, operation, which was uh, brutal. According to official government figures, the anti-terrorist operation has caused between two and 300 civilian deaths. Civilian deaths. And this is supposed to be an anti-terrorist operation which you single out uh, people and take them out, you know. Uh, so this is really a, a, a war against uh, against the, the people of the south and the, and the east by the by the government. There are quite clearly in the whole movement and now in the Donetsk and Luhansk republics different elements uh, involved, different political elements uh, involved, and we should be quite clear about uh, this. Uh, there is a very strong feeling. Uh, that uh, the, the, a very strong anti-oligarchic feeling. For instance, if you read the proclamation of the Donetsk uh, Republic, the act of sovereignty that they uh, issued, uh, you can read clearly that it says, in there it says that uh, the, the natural wealth, uh, coal mining and so on, should be the property of the state, should be collective uh, ownership, there should be no privatization of uh, that. It also says that there should be no exploitation of, of uh, labor, whatever that means, but it obviously clearly means that they are, they are somehow against uh, capitalism. And it says a whole number of things like, uh, like that. It even says at the beginning, and this is an interesting point, it says that uh, the Donetsk Republic is to be a multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, republic with respect for linguistic and national rights of all the minorities composing the region, which, which breaks with the official line of Kiev that this is a pro-Russian nationalist uh, movement. Quite clearly, there are Russian nationalist elements in it, and people look towards Russia for help in defending their rights. Uh, mistakenly or not, we can discuss that, but uh, this, is the, this is the case. But you see, in the, in the Donbass region, i.e. in the Donetsk and Luhansk uh, regions, uh, being uh, uh, industrial regions that were developed in the Soviet Union, there is a strong feeling that the people who live there uh, have kind of a national identity of the Donbass. They don't consider themselves necessarily Russians or Ukrainians or any other thing, because workers from many parts of the old Soviet Union went there to look for work, to work in the mines. And obviously, as we, as we know, mine, work, mine uh, working is a very dangerous uh, uh, job. And this tends to cre create strong bonds of class solidarity above any national uh, divisions amongst the workforce in these uh, places. And many commentators have pointed out that there is a strong feeling of this proletarian uh, 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 identity in the Donbass, which is not necessarily Russian or Ukrainian or anything uh, else. In fact, one comrade from Ukraine was telling me that the language they, they speak, many of the people in uh, Donbass speak, is not really Russian, that uh, the Ukrainians consider it Russian, but the Russians wouldn't necessarily understand everything that this uh, said. So they, they have kind of a, an, a, an identity in that region, which is very proletarian. But obviously there are also elements of Russian nationalism, and there are elements of, of reactionary Russian nationalism. We've all seen uh, Russian monarchist i.e. Em Russian Empire flags in some of these uh, demonstrations in Kharkov, in Donetsk, in Luhansk, and in other places. And this is a reactionary trend that we must recognize and, and identify and, and, and distance the ourselves from, from it because it's not progressive at all. Uh, and it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't help the movement go uh, forward. And some of the people who uh, accidentally become the leaders of these uh, movements, including some people with positions in this 
uh, republics are reactionaries. For instance, this guy, Strelkov, <coughs> who's now, if I'm not wrong, the Minister of uh, Defense or in charge of the armed forces in the Donetsk Republic, who's based in Slovyansk, is a Russian uh, who is, uh, his hobby is uh, military reenactment and he specializes in the white side of the Russian Civil War. And he's someone who's put in writing some very reactionary uh, Russian imperialist, uh, R Russian monarchist uh, views. Uh, and and he's, he's come to lead this movement. Why? Because there was no one else with uh, military experience, or he was the most military expert person. And he's shown this over the last few weeks. And he's now uh, leading the, the resistance in, in Slovyansk, at least the military side of it. And some other people who are leaders of this, people, of this uh, movement, uh, like Guba, Paul Gubarev and Denis Pushilin and other people, have uh, murky past uh, combination of Russian nationalism and uh, Orthodox Christian ideas and very strange uh, greater Russian nationalist reactionary ideas. Uh, but this doesn't determine the character of the, of the movement. If you look at it, for instance, there was one point around the 16th of, uh, <coughs> I think it was around the 16th of, uh, of May, when Ahmetov, everyone uh, in Kiev was saying that Ahmetov is financing this uh, protest. Ahmetov being one of the wealthiest uh, uh, businessmen, rather thieves in uh, Ukraine, oligarchs in Ukraine with uh, properties up here in, uh, in Hyde Park in London. And, uh, and he, is, uh, he is one of the, he employs about 300, his companies employ about 300,000 people in the region, in the Donbass mainly. And he said, he came out quite clearly against the Donetsk Republic. And he said, we're going to introduce peace. And we're going to mobilize the workers in the factories that I own against the Donetsk Republic. And so he called for a one hour general strike and workers' mobilizations and a big rally at the Shakhtar uh, Donbass uh, Arena, which he owns. This is the, the, the local team that he is also the owner of. And, uh, and what happened on the day? This is the point. What happened? He employs 300,000 people. You know, there's high unemployment in Ukraine. People are afraid to lose their jobs. You will think that he is able to uh, force some people to go to a rally. Well, the, the, the Donbass Arena, uh, there were 300 people. <coughs> there were 300 people, which was really pathetic, and they all, uh, most of them interviewed by Western journalists, said that they didn't know why they were there. <laughs> they, were there for about, they were there for about 10 minutes, and then they were listening to a, to a broadcast from uh, Asmetov on a massive uh, screen, and then they went uh, home. And then some Western journalists have obviously been told by the PR department of these uh, Asmetov companies to go to this one steel factory, steel mill, in uh, Yenakievo, uh, which employs a few thousand uh, people, and that there they will be able to see the Ahmetov uh, Donbass for Peace movement and uh, the strength of it. So the journalists went, and there was a journalist from the, I think it's from the Financial Times, and he was tweeting about this event, and he said, well, there's about 300, 400 people here. This is a massive factory, thousands of workers. 300 people. Listen to the direct, listening to the director of the company, so we, we know this is not a strike, it's a, it's a lockout at the best. Uh, and, and then when he interviewed them, they said, and this is the guy who says this in his, in his uh, account, uh, this is a Western journalist who has no interest in, uh, in uh, embellishing the opposition against, uh, against Kiev. And the guys said, the, the guys he, he interviewed, the workers he interviewed, they said that uh, regardless of our political opinions, here 90% of the workers are against the national uh, government of uh, Kiev. And the majority support the Donetsk uh, Republic. And a few of our workmates have actually joined the militias and are fighting uh, arms in hand uh, for the Donetsk uh, Republic. That gives you a clear idea. And uh, immediately after Ahmetov took this move, how did the Donetsk Republic respond? Well, they sent the uh, armed people to his uh, offices and demanded that he should be paying taxes to uh, the Donetsk Republic, or else his properties will be expropriated. 
Uh, so regardless of the political uh, views, the class character of the, uh, of the movement is pushing them in one particular direction. Whether they will go to the end or not is a different uh, matter. And actually the properties of Akhmetov have not yet been uh, expropriated. But there's been a whole number of threats that point in that uh, direction. And it's very clear why. Um, uh, because Akhmetov is the richest man in the region, he controls uh, industry. If anyone has got any idea of uh, setting up an independent republic in the Donetsk, they need to control these uh, resources. Uh, so this is a very interesting uh, point about the class character of the, of the movement. There is also another element which we've seen in these movements, which is an element of uh, e even pro, uh, this is an interesting point, even pro-Russian uh, sentiment in these regions is based on, the f in, based on economic uh, uh, reasons. The, in the same opinion poll that they quoted before, that was conducted by some Kiev-based uh, study center, they asked people who's, who said why they were looking up to Russia. And the first reason they were, that most people gave in the south and the east was because in Russia, wages of industrial workers are higher. Uh, and this is an actual fact. Wages in Ukraine are lower than in Russia. So, but I mean, that doesn't tell you, that doesn't paint a picture of people who are Russian fanatic, Russian nationalists, that they, all, they, all they want is to join Russia. No, it paints a picture of people who want higher wages. And unfortunately, because there's no other alternative, they think that the be best way to get higher wages is by joining uh, with Russia or allying themselves with uh, Russia. Uh, and there is also a strong element of Soviet uh, nostalgia. Uh, and you, you can understand why this is, because... And the, most of these events took place around the 9th of May, which is uh, the day of the victory of the, of the Soviet army against Nazi Germany. <coughs> and this is a big thing in Ukraine. If I'm not wrong, about, uh, about uh, between 3 and 4 million people in Ukraine joined the Soviet, uh, were part of the Soviet army at the, ta at the time of the struggle against uh, uh, Nazi Germany. And they were all, all those who were part of the Soviet army were given this St. George uh, medal for, for value. And this is an interesting uh, point because it means that many people have relatives who fought in that uh, war. And when they see a government which is composed of parties that uh, commemorating the founding of the SS uh, Galicia, this is like a, provo a clear provocation. And it's no, no wonder that people feel, many people in this region feel that their struggle is a struggle against fascism. Uh, and this is a very strong feeling. Uh, and in my opinion, this is a very progressive uh, uh, feeling. Also, people are looking back to a time, 25 years ago, at the time of the Soviet Union, where there was no mass unemployment, uh, no epidemic of drug addiction, no mass emigration from the country, no destruction of uh, culture and uh, education and general standards of the uh, people. They, they're looking back to something that was much uh, better than what they have uh, uh, now. And this is a progressive uh, feeling that if channeled in the right direction, could play a revolutionary role. As a, as a parenthesis, I'd like to, to mention another interesting fact, which is that this St. George ribbon that you've seen, which is, um, is kind of orange and, uh, and black stripes, is the same is the is the Saint George Medal for <coughs> Military Value, and it's got an interesting story because this was uh, created under uh, the Russian Empire and uh, uh, Catherine the Great, and it was instituted as a medal for military uh, value of the Russian uh, Empire. In 1917, when the Bolsheviks came to power, they abolished such a reactionary uh, medal of value for for, for military. Valor, a uh, courage. Uh, they abolished it, and this was a progressive act. And it was only reinstituted by Stalin in uh, 1940, in the 1940s, in the struggle against uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, and this fits into uh, Stalinism, isn't it? Stalinism contained a strong element of anti-Semitism and great Russian nationalism. Uh, obviously, this is not what it means for the people in Ukraine today. It means it means a struggle against fascism. But it's also interesting to know the full story of this, of this uh, uh, symbol. So, uh, also in the last uh, few weeks, this uh, anti-oligarchic mood in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, you can also see it in other significant events. There have been at least two 
big demonstrations of miners, mine workers in Donetsk. The last one, a few day, only a few days ago, I think on the 18th of uh, June, if I'm, if I'm correct, where there were five to 10,000 miners from 16 different mines marching into Donetsk uh, against the anti-terrorist operation, demanding that the troops be, be withdrawn immediately and giving, giving the Kiev government a 48-hour ultimatum and saying that unless the troops were withdrawn, the, uh, the miners will join the armed defense of the Donetsk uh, Republic. And it seems, there's been some uh, reports, that already a miners battalion of the Donetsk Republic forces has been created, and on the first day, 500 miners signed up to join. Which is not a large number, but we're talking about people who know that they're joining an uh, armed force, which is probably going to be smashed in the next uh, few days and weeks, but they see that this is the only way to defend the families, the jobs, the livelihoods, and the, and the towns. You have to understand that there's a situation, for instance, in Slovyansk, which is an industrial city of 120,000 people, where they've been bombed, systematically bombed with heavy artillery for weeks now, uh, probably six weeks or eight weeks since the actual uh, bombardment started, including aerial uh, bombardment. And we know you bomb the heavily populated uh, town, you're not going to hit military targets, you're going to hit everything, hospitals, uh, nurseries, schools, uh, residential homes. About half of the population have already been forced to leave the town and the remainder are living there, but they have no uh, water, very little access to electricity. And for the last five or three or five days, they've been completely surrounded. The siege by the military uh, forces of uh, Ukraine has completed around the city of Slovians. They can't go in or uh, out. And it is in these conditions where Poroshenko, the new president, says that he's declared a ceasefire. What kind of ceasefire is this? First of all, it's not a real ceasefire because they're still bombing them. But even if there was a real ceasefire, what ceasefire can you have in a, in a, in a city that's completely blockaded? It's basically death by starvation. That's what, that's what his policy is. Um, so this is the, this is the current uh, situation. When the anti-terrorist operation started, as I said before, there was this uh, incident of fraternization, uh, troops refusing to fight and so on. So immediately the Kiev government stepped up uh, its challenge and recruited the paramilitary fascist gangs into the National Guard. The National Guard didn't exist before or had been disbanded for a few years and was recreated now, reformed, reestablished. And it was reestablished on the basis of patriotic volunteers who wanted to go and fight the terrorists and the Russian agents in the East. And the people who joined up were obviously fascist. Uh, the maiden self-defense, the right sector, the patriots of Ukraine, Brotherhood, uh, Svoboda supporters, and all the assorted uh, ragtag of uh, fascist uh, thugs that joined these uh, battalions. At the beginning, they were a bit, uh, uh, they, weren't, they weren't so open about this, but it was clear what was happening. But now, in the last two weeks, they've come out uh, openly. You know, I mean, this, uh, there's this one uh, battalion that played a key role in the so called liberation of Mariupol. Uh, the Azov battalion is composed and commanded by fascists. Uh, I mean, the, the, all the main commanders of this battalion are members of Patriots Ukraine, which is a fascist organization with uh, neo-Nazi symbols, and they take oaths uh, on, on, under this neo-Nazi flag. And uh, these, these are uh, fanatics, complete, complete fanatics, who are prepared to kill anyone. And this is the situation that you have now, a government that is increasingly relying on these forces because the ordinary troops are in no mood to fight in these places. There have been many reports of mutinies amongst reserve soldiers, of protests by relatives of soldiers who are physically preventing the troops from being sent to the east. Because I mean, when you have a reserve uh, army, these are people who have jobs and uh, so on. They're not quite prepared to go uh, into the east when people, when people are being killed when the rebels are inflicting damage to the Ukrainian uh, troops, they're not quite prepared to go and uh, fight for a government that, well, I mean, maybe represents them or maybe not. And they have jobs, families, and, and, and things to, to protect. So the government is increasingly relying on these uh, forces. Now, what are the, what are the perspectives for this uh, conflict? Well, I'll try to uh, finish on this uh, point. Now, in the last... Uh, 
in the last couple of days, I think it was uh, uh, Friday night or Saturday morning, Poroshenko announced this 14 or 15 point peace plan. And the peace plan on, uh, on paper looks uh, very good. All the measures that are promised look very good. You know, I mean, they propose federalization, uh, recognizing of the status for Russian language, the possibility of the regions, <coughs> the possibility of the regions to elect their own governors to keep part of the tax revenue, an amnesty for all uh, rebels who have not killed civilians or, uh, or Ukrainian troops, and uh, a safe passage for anyone who wants to uh, give up weapons back to Russia if they want to go back, if they want to go, go to Russia, and a whole number of measures. But I mean, if you look at it, the main point of this, uh, of this proposal is that he's not prepared to talk to terrorists. So this is a proposal not to negotiate with uh, people who, in one way or another, represent the movement in the, in the <coughs> southeast, but to smash it. This is the aim of this movement. Uh, it appears as a, as a peace plan, so it can sell it to the international uh, world uh, bourgeois opinion, to the West and so on, and is trying to rope uh, Putin uh, in. If Putin says, no, I am against this peace plan, then Putin is against peace and is an aggressor and so on. But in reality, this is not the, the case. This, this peace plan is designed to smash the rebels. And Strelkov, <clears throat> the head of the armed forces of the Donetsk Republic, in a few days ago, he issued a statement, and he made the position very clear. He said, we do not have the arm, the military forces. He's a reactionary, uh, and he's also very, he's a bit mad, in my, in my opinion, if you actually read his writings. But he is an, an expert military uh, person, and he can judge the situation from a military point of view. And from a military point of view, he says, look, we are completely surrounded. And, and in one day or two days, this was five days ago when he wrote this, we're going we're gonna to be completely cut off from the Russian border, through which some uh, help uh, is coming in. We're going to be completely cut off from the Russian border. And after that, it will be just a question of time. Uh, we can resist maybe a few weeks or maybe a few months. But slowly, the Russian, the, the Ukrainian troops are going to be advancing, and finally, we're going to be completely uh, smashed. He, he says we don't have the artillery uh, and so on to advance on any positions that we lose, and every day we're losing 100 yards here, 100 yards there. We can positions we can't defend, uh, and this is the situation. And he finally he says, unless there is urgent help from the Kremlin, we finished. But then he adds, and from what I can see. In the last few weeks, there is not going to be any help from the Kremlin. He says that Putin has betrayed us, has abandoned us. It's not that Putin ever said that he was going to help them, but these people in the leadership of the Donetsk Republic, they really believed that uh, this was going to be like Crimea. They declare an independent republic, have a referendum, and Russia takes them uh, over. So he feels betrayed by Russia, and he says, and probably the struggle will pick up again at a later date, after there is a Maidan in uh, Moscow, i.e. after this current government in Moscow is uh, overthrown. Obviously, this is a very narrow perspective that he has because he is a Russian nationalist and a military expert, is speaking from, from in that capacity. Obviously, the, the, the way forward, because a civil war is never a military, mainly a military conflict. It obviously has a military aspect, but it's mainly a political conflict. And if the Donetsk Republic and the Luhansk Republic were to act on the promise to expropriate the oligarchs, and they made a class appeal, and they armed the workers, and they gave the movement a class content, this will have an appeal in the rest of the, of the country. If it was posed in terms of class and democracy, as opposed to being uh, posed in terms of, uh, of uh, Russian uh, nationalism, which is obviously not attractive for workers in the rest of the country. And what is really surprising now is the extent to which in the rest of the country, in the West, in the center, in uh, places like Lvov, in places like Chernivsky, and in other places like this, there are mutinies and rebellions of the ordinary population against the government. They don't want the troops to be sent to fight in the East. That, that, that gives you an indication that the, this government is not strong. It's a government that's based on nationalist hysteria, but in, in as much as this government is not even able to smash the terrorists in their own, uh, in their own narrative or in their own language, uh, this government is also being challenged by the most extreme uh, elements. These, these people from the right sector and patriots Ukraine, 
they're not happy with the government. They're not happy with the government, not because it's not, uh, it's because it's not reactionary, uh, because it's not a, a democratic government. It's because it's not reactionary enough. It's not putting enough uh, effort in the anti-terrorist operation. And there, there's also movements in that uh, direction. Now, uh, therefore, I will say that the, obviously war is a very complex uh, equation. It's very difficult to, uh, to see what's going to happen uh, next. There might be some event in the East that forces uh, Putin to, uh, to uh, intervene in one way or, or another, you know, because if there is a massacre of the, civ of the civilian population in Slovyansk, the pressure in Russia might be such that uh, Putin has to intervene in one way or another. But the government has been careful to uh, uh, try to avoid, uh, the government in Kiev try to avoid uh, that. In the last few days, there's been lots of provocations in the border. Uh, Russian border post has been attacked by Ukrainian forces. Uh, Ukrainian border posts have been attacked by rival forces and so on, and, uh, and obviously the situation is very complex. But in our opinion, the only way forward will be a class policy. Uh, and unfortunately, <laughs> forces proposing this are not very uh, strong at the moment. They're not in the leadership of these uh, two uh, republics, uh, quite clearly. But the pressure in that direction does uh, exist, as been told. In the last uh, few days of, for instance, the Communist Party in Luhansk uh, issued a statement saying they fully support the rebels and so on. There's been an attempt to re rebuild the Communist Party in Donetsk, which involves not only elements from the current Communist Party, the leadership of which is uh, rotten and, uh, and reactionary, but elements from Borodpa, this other left-wing organization, all the left-wing uh, elements. There have been appeals put out to miners and workers in these regions. And so you can see amongst all the nationalist uh, hysteria, amongst the fog of war, the elements of a class uh, uh, position that start to, starts to uh, emerge. And I say it, it will be exaggerated to say the fascism is in power in, uh, in uh, Kiev and that the situation is going to be one of black reaction for 20 or, or 30 uh, years. This is not the case, not the case uh, yet at least. There is a reactionary government in Kiev that is strongly reliant on fascist paramilitary gangs to carry out its policies. The possibility for working class and left-wing organizations to operate legally doesn't exist. Uh, but nevertheless, they are operating. And they are, I mean, all the people who went to demonstrations in Kharkov, uh, people who went to tens of thousands who went to demonstrations in Odessa and in other places, they're still there. They're not gone anywhere, and uh, they, they, they're probably just waiting for the right time and the right opportunity to come back into the struggle uh, again. And this is not, I would say, this is not a strong uh, government, despite all the support it has from the West, from Washington, and from the oligarchs. Now, the oligarchs, all of them have, have, uh, have uh, united behind this uh, government. This is certainly not a strong government, one that is riddled by many contradictions. And, that, and also it's a government that has an impossible task, uh, which is to implement neoliberal uh, capitalist reforms. They're going to hit the population everywhere, not only in the East, but also in the West. In the last month, inflation uh, rate was 25%. At the time when uh, they are freezing wages and, uh, and uh, pensions, they are sacking public sector workers, they're destroying industry and, and so on. People, uh, at one point or another, are going to rebel against this nationalist uh, hysteria and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and take, take this government up to uh, account. What is, the, what is the task of Marxists in this situation? First of all, to oppose the Kiev uh, government for all the reasons that I have uh, said. To oppose our own governments in the imperialist uh, countries, in uh, Britain, in the US, in Germany and so on, which are supporting this uh, government. Uh, this is our main uh, uh, enemy. And uh, third, to offer whatever practical, political, and uh, material solidarity that we can to the anti-fascist uh, fighters in, uh, in, uh, in the Ukraine. This doesn't mean that we have to give any political support to the current leadership of the Donetsk uh, Republic, but we're certainly against the anti-terrorist uh, operation. And we try to build links to those elements, uh, most progressive elements within the anti-fascist uh, movement, within, within the movement against the Kiev uh, government, particularly forces like Borodba, which uh, forces like Borodba, this uh, <clears throat> struggle uh, union, uh, which throughout the conflict have maintained a very consistent position, not only very uh, a class position, but also a position that is internationalist. Uh, 
that they've not um, made any concessions to Russian nationalism or anything like this, and that they are in a very difficult uh, uh, position. They've, they've had basically to go uh, underground. So this is the um, this is the, the conclusion of what we think we should be uh, we, we should be our main uh, task. There are some there are some people who are opposing the the campaign we've uh, helped to set up on the basis that this is uh, that on the basis that there are also fascists on the on the side of the Donetsk Republic and certainly there are fascists. There are all sorts of uh, strange uh, and accidental elements. Whenever whenever a military conflict uh, a conflict becomes mainly a military conflict. Those elements that, uh, that like to fight, that are more, that are better at the military side of the conflict, come to the to the fore, and all political discussions are, are pushed to the ground. There are people who say that this is a struggle between Ukraine, which is a semi-colonial country, against Russian uh, imperialism. This is completely missing the the point. This is not a struggle for self-determination of uh, Ukraine. Ukraine is already run by uh, NATO and by uh, Washington. What self-determination is there in uh, Ukraine? And as a matter of fact, Russian uh, intervention is very little. Even the Russian nationalists like Strelkov are complaining that the Kremlin has abandoned uh, them. What more uh, proof do you want? And, and, uh, and the most dangerous thing is this. If you take a position that this is a struggle against Russian imperialism and its agents in the, in the country, you immediately, if you follow uh, through, you fall behind the anti-terrorist operation, the Kiev government and the fascist gangs that are carrying out this anti-terrorist uh, operation. So this is uh, clear. We're not on that. We're not on that. Uh, we're not on that uh, on that side. And uh, just to go back to the to the beginning, uh, the comrades from uh, the comrades from uh, Borodba, they said that if they made one mistake, is that they thought that they will have a, a more prolonged period of uh, bourgeois democratic conditions to carry out the, the work and they weren't sufficiently prepared for the situation that uh, developed. And when it came to the right time, they were able to play a role in places like Kharkov and Odessa, bigger role in these two places, but a weaker role in other, in other parts of the country like Donetsk and Luhansk, un unfortunately, and this is their own uh, self-criticism that they, they make themselves. And so what I will say is that obviously the situation in Ukraine is not uh, the same as the situation in Britain, but it, but it gives you a sense of urgency in the need to build a Marxist uh, leadership, the forces of Marxism, so that when big events take place, we are able to play a leading role or to fight to, to be able to be in the leadership of uh, any movement that takes uh, place, so that this movement is not diverted along other lines. <coughs>